This audiobook was created using text-to-speech software, and was not read by a real person. Please keep in mind the limitations of the technology when it comes to pacing and pronunciation. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the story. Star Trek, The Next Generation Section 31 Rogue Written by Andy Mangles and Michael A. Martin Audiobook Adaptation by YJK Audiobooks Preview Six months before the Borg's temporal incursion to prevent first contact, the crew of the Enterprise face a very different kind of crisis. A world in turmoil becomes the focal point of conspiracy and betrayal, as an unexpected reunion brings startling revelations. Prologue Stardate, 50907.2 Population, approximately 9 billion, all, Borg. Picard's breath fogged the large window on his cabin wall, the moisture momentarily making the view of his homeworld indistinct, and devoid of color. Even now, five days after they'd been uttered, Data's words reverberated through his mind, as he once again relived that terrible moment on the bridge. On the main viewscreen, had been an Earth altered beyond belief, its continents transformed into a bleak technological sprawl, its oceans dark, its atmosphere thin and gray. Caught in the temporal wake of a Borg sphere, Picard and his crew had seen with their own horrified eyes, what the Borg had wrought by fleeing into Earth's past. But the Enterprise had pursued them, and in so doing, stopped the Borg from assimilating Earth, and ensured the completion of humanity's historic first warp flight. Picard closed his eyes and straightened his posture, moving his forehead off the back of his hand. His breath evaporated, and Earth was restored to its tranquil blue and white. And now we're back in the present, Picard thought somberly. Earth is as it was, at least as far as we know. Although, who really knows what effect our presence in the past, however carefully controlled and covered up, has had on this timeline. He had told his crew that they were going back to repair whatever damage the Borg had done, but how much change had his own actions in the past had upon the present? Picard didn't like thinking about the issues inherent in the temporal tampering, though the analytical portions of his mind had wandered there all too often in the last few days. If the Enterprise crew aided Zephram Cochran's 21st century voyage, hadn't they always been there in the mists of history, however unrecorded? And if the Borg had conquered Earth and had then been beaten back, hadn't that always occurred? Following Data's own theoretical ruminations on the topic, Picard had been forced to tell him to keep the subject to himself, he was tired of thinking about it. Better than thinking about the alternative, the voice in the back of his head would tell him. Picard and his crew were already dealing with the direct consequences of their journey, and even though they had saved the future of mankind, the reward of that knowledge seemed to pale when stacked against the costs. It had taken LaForge and his engineers a couple of days to create a makeshift replacement for their lost navigational array, one capable of reproducing the effect that had allowed them to journey to the past in the first place. During that time, Will Riker and Worf had been busy rounding up the ASRV lifeboats that were jettisoned when Picard had initiated the Enterprise's autodestruct sequence. Once that danger and Borg threat had been stopped, retrieving the nearly 200 escape pods had proven more challenging than his officers had expected. Some had made it to Earth, some had lingered in orbit. Although about three-quarters of them had made it to the rendezvous point on Gravit Island in the South Pacific, crew members from some of the other autonomous survival and recovery vehicles had been grounded elsewhere, mostly due to Borg-related system glitches. Many of those had dispersed into the regions they landed in, some taking refuge in the wilderness in case of Borg pursuit, others trying their best to blend in, with the ragged factions of post-apocalypse humanity they encountered. Most of the repairs to the Enterprise had to wait until the ship got to McKinley Station, where they were now docked. Most of the crew were still in the long queues for the Starbase's massive medical complex. They had to be quarantined, scanned, and decontaminated, not only for any possible Borg infection, but for any viral or bacterial pathogens they may have picked up while in the past. 
It wouldn't do to release a 21st century virus, whether natural or bioengineered, into the 24th century. After being given clean bills of health, the crew would have some time off. How much time was unknown at this point? Engineering crews, all wearing biohazard containment suits, were scouring the ship, removing the self-replicating board technology from corridors and circuit panels and Jeffrey's tubes. Many of the ship's main systems would have to be repaired as well. Panels were off the walls, and circuitry was spread across the deck plates. Only a year out in the Enterprise E, and were already in need of a major overhaul, thought Picard, his rumination still dark. Picard's own cabin was untouched, and, except for the occasionally malfunctioning environmental controls, it offered him a place of rest and solitude. He knew that the repair crews hadn't touched his ready room yet. He suspected that Riker had told them not to. It too, had not been violated by the Borg or their technology, but the display case which had held models of the previous starship's Enterprise, was still half-destroyed, smashed by the phaser rifle Picard had swung at the case during his fit of peak. You broke your little ships, the woman from the past had said. Lily Sloan had known that the battle against the Borg was too personal for him. But it wasn't until afterward, when he saw the wrecked models, that Picard had seen it too. He heard a knock, and the door of his quarters swished halfway open before grinding to a halt. Captain, a voice questioned. Two strong hands pushed the door the rest of the way into its wall recess, and Picard turned, seeing a familiar face. Like the captain, Riker had hardly slept the last several days, and the bags under his eyes showed it. Rather a mess out there, wouldn't you say, number one, Picard asked, gesturing out the door, where work crews could be seen removing board conduit hoses from a ceiling duct. Yes sir. From the reports I'm hearing, the Borg circuitry got farther into our systems than we realized. We're lucky we made it back in one piece, Riker said. He didn't need to add the words, this time. Picard sat on his couch, gesturing for his first officer to sit opposite him. It was late, but until the Borg matter was completely concluded, Picard didn't mind Riker interrupting his all too rare quiet time. The pad his first officer carried hadn't escaped the captain's notice, and as much as Picard might not wish to face the duty it represented, he knew that he must. He owed it to them. But not just yet. How is everyone coping? he asked. Medically, most of the crew appears to be fine. Dr. Crusher and Nurse Ogawa were cleared very quickly, and they've been helping in the sick bays on McKinley. So far everyone's been in the clear. They're trying to process our people through the rest of the tests as quickly as possible. They've even got a dozen or so EMH programs running. I'm glad we aren't forced to use one of those on our ship very often. They don't quite have Beverly's bedside manner. Picard crossed over and sat behind his desk, sinking into his chair. Riker continued. Worf has to depart for Deep Space Nine as soon as possible, perhaps first thing in the morning. Things are getting very tense with the Dominion, and they need him back there. Chief O'Brien's going to have his hands full finishing the repairs on the Defiant that the McKinley Tech started. Data's eye and skin have been repaired. And, understandably, Deanna's been especially busy since we returned. She's coping well with the workload, though she swears she'll never touch a drop of tequila again. Pardon? Riker grinned for perhaps the first time in days. She got a little drunk down there with Cochrane, sir. But I can assure you it was purely in the line of duty. What was it like, Picard asked suddenly, leaning forward. Riker looked at him quizzically. The Phoenix. What was it like? I got to, I touched it, but you, you rode in it. You and Geordi were part of it. Mankind's first warp flight. Riker's demeanor loosened a bit, and he focused his eyes on the windows, out into space. I don't know if I can describe it. I've never felt anything so unsettling since flight training at the academy, and this was even worse. I wasn't sure that we weren't going to blow apart at any second, that the ship wasn't going to scatter me through space nearly 300 years before I was even born. The whole time this song was playing, ear-splittingly loud, 
and my teeth were vibrating. And we saw the Enterprise out of the window, and... Riker paused, as though collecting his thoughts. We take it for granted, Jean-Luc. He rarely called the captain by his first name, but at this moment it seemed to come naturally. We move among the stars every day at high warp, surrounded by all the comforts of a posh hotel. But being there, jammed into that little cockpit, with my teeth chattering and my ears ringing, as we just barely made warp one. It was the fastest I've ever moved in my life. The two officers sat in silence then, Riker staring into the darkness of space, Picard closing his eyes and clasping his hands together. After a brief time, Riker sniffed, and wiped at his nose. Picard opened his eyes again, as Riker cleared his throat. Geordi is working with the McKinley crews on cleanup, but I'm going to have to order him to take some downtime. Barkley is. Well, I think Barkley may be asking for a transfer off the ship. He seems ill at ease with everything that's happened. You know how he is with people, anyhow. I think he may just want to take on a less exciting atmosphere for a while. Picard's mouth pursed into a grim smile. There are times when I think that might be the best choice myself. Riker hesitated, then handed the pad to his captain. He didn't seem to want to acknowledge its contents, neither did Picard. This is the final casualty report. We lost 17 back on Earth from the ASRV landings. 148 crewpersons were assimilated by the Borg. All of them are now dead. Those that weren't killed in combat, or as a consequence of the plasma coolant that flooded engineering, apparently couldn't survive the death of the Queen. Picard nodded without speaking, remembering the malfunctioning drones who fell around him, and the hideous sight of the model-skinned woman dissolving before his eyes. Do you think we've seen the last of the Borg? Now that their queen is dead. Picard sighed heavily. We can always hope. But I don't think so, number one. Riker continued his oral report. The bodies of those who were assimilated have been quarantined to the Borg Sciences Unit for study. Finally, 25 people were killed in combat against Borg drones. Total loss, 190 crew members. Picard looked down at the pad in his hand, frowning. The names scrolled by slowly, in no particular order. Carter, Lynch, Batson, Nelson, Iger, Miriven, Trett, Kulin, Rixa, Porter. All of them, dead. Not just dead, but assimilated, then dead. They couldn't even be properly buried until they had been taken apart by Starfleet scientists. And given some of the secrets which he knew some subsections of Starfleet were capable of holding, Picard wasn't even sure that the crew members' families would ever receive their kin's remains. As if to underscore this thought, the pad scrolled down to another name. Hawk, Sean Liam, Lieutenant. He too, knew about some of Starfleet's darkest secrets. Or rather had known. Were we able to recover Lieutenant Hawk's body, Picard asked, almost too softly for Riker to hear. No sir. We're assuming that it stayed in low Earth orbit for some time after we left 2063. Data thinks that atmospheric drag would have brought it down eventually. It would have, burned up, then. Picard shut his eyes tightly, remembering the scene. He, Worf, and Hawk had all been in their environmental suits, their magnetized boots allowing them to traverse the ventral side of the Enterprise's hull. They had just about freed the maglock servo clamps for the particle emitter dish, in their attempt to stop the Borg from using it as an interplexing beacon to summon other Borg cubes, when Hawk was caught by a Borg drone. Shortly thereafter, with Borg nanoprobes creeping through his bloodstream, controlling him and necrotizing his flesh, Hawk had tried to stop Picard from completing the command sequence to free the final clamp. Worf had then blasted Hawk with his phaser rifle, sending the young lieutenant tumbling away into the void of space. Picard remembered the look on Hawk's face, as the last vestiges of his humanity fought against the Borg nanoprobes coursing through him. Even if Hawk had burned up in the atmosphere, Picard doubted that that was what had ended his life. Assuming that Worf's phaser blast hadn't killed him, the lieutenant had most likely suffocated in his environment suit, frightened and alone as his humanity was torn from him. 
Picard shuddered. He knew what it was like to have his consciousness subsumed within the hive mind of the collective. After the Borg Queen had been destroyed, what then? What had Hawk thought in the last few hours of his life, separated from both humanity and the collective? Damn, said Picard softly, putting the pad down on the table. Riker stood and leaned forward, momentarily putting a supportive hand on his captain's shoulder, and then exited the room without a word. The pad blinked. Hawk, Sean Liam, Lieutenant. Hawk, Sean Liam, Lieutenant. Such a loss. So enthusiastic and passionate. So much promise. Hawk had been on the ship slightly less than a year, transferring with a group of others onto the newly commissioned Enterprise E. It didn't take long for him to be assigned to the con during Alpha Watch. He was bright and fast, and well-liked by all. He had said how pleased he was to serve aboard Starfleet's flagship, which he considered a special honor since he was only a few years out of the academy. But that time had been long enough for Hawk to forge a personal relationship with a man whom he loved, long enough for him to rise in the ranks, long enough for him to reach his own personal crossroad. Everyone eventually reaches a crossroad, if he lives long enough. Six months ago, Lieutenant Hawk had reached his. Chapter 1 Stardate 50368.0 The coffee cup suffused Captain Karen Blaylock's hands with a cheery warmth, as she strode purposefully onto the bridge of her ship, the Excelsior-class starship, Slayton. Though the Alpha Watch wasn't due to begin for another ten minutes, she wasn't at all surprised to see several key bridge officers already hard at work at their consoles, which hummed and beeped agreeably. Commander Ernst Roger, her executive officer, turned toward her in the command chair and favored her with a reserved smile. Captain on the bridge, he said, vacating the seat for her. Heads turned toward Blaylock, distracted momentarily from their vigilance. These were good officers, science and engineering specialists all, and she hated allowing command protocol to interfere with their work, even momentarily. She often envied them their single-minded dedication to discovery. How ironic, she thought, to have allowed her command responsibilities to come between her and the very thing that had brought her out to the galactic hinterlands in the first place, the pursuit of pure knowledge. Blaylock nodded as silent as you were, and each crew member quickly returned to the work at hand. She took her seat and sipped her coffee. Commander Corton Zweller approached Blaylock from the science station on the bridge's starboard side. His thick shock of white hair was belied by the boyish twinkle in his eye. During the nearly four months he had served as chief science officer, he had proven to be a valuable member of the Slayton team. Though by no means a brilliant researcher, Zweller was well-liked by the other science specialists, an administrator apparently gifted with the good sense not to step on the toes of his better-trained subordinates, unless absolutely necessary. The anomaly still seems to be hiding from us, Zweller said. So far, at least. Blaylock sighed, disappointed. The Slayton had last made long-range sensor contact with the subspace anomaly eight days previously, but had turned up nothing since. Several weeks before that, the Federation's Argus Array Subspace Observatory had detected intermittent but extremely powerful waves of subspace distortion that seemed to be coming from the region of space for which the Slayton was now headed. Unfortunately, the phenomenon had neither lasted long enough, nor repeated itself regularly enough, to reveal much else. How wonderful it would have been, Blaylock reflected, to have discovered an entirely new physical phenomenon while en route to a dreary diplomatic appointment on God's Forsaken Kiaros 4. But Blaylock knew it would be just her luck for the anomaly to return briefly, and then vanish forever, while she and her crew were preoccupied with the tedium of galactic politics. The captain turned toward Lieutenant Glebeck, the Antidean helmsman. In the years since Glebeck had come aboard, Blaylock had assiduously avoided asking the galley replicators to create sushi, one of her favorite foods. Glebeck, who was essentially a two-meter-tall humanoid fish, was notably edgy about such things. Like most of her kind, 
Glebuck would have found the rigors of interstellar travel intolerable but for the effects of the cortical stimulator she wore on her neck. Its constant output of vertigo-nullifying neural impulses kept her from lapsing into a self-protective catatonic state during long space voyages. Despite this handicap, or perhaps because of it, Glebuck was one of the best helm officers Blaylock had ever worked with. What's our present ETA at the Kiaro system? Blaylock asked Glebuck. The helmsman fixed an unblinking, monocular gaze on the captain and whispered into the tiny universal translator mounted in the collar of her hydration suit. The Slayton will reach the precise center of the gulf in approximately 53 minutes. We will arrive at the fringes of the Kiaro system some six minutes later. Blaylock nodded. Almost the precise center of the Geminus Gulf, she thought with a tinge of awe. Three wide, nearly empty sectors. Sixty light years across, all together. Nearly two weeks travel time at maximum warp. Even after a decade of Starship Command, she found it hard to wrap her mind around such enormous distances. During the long voyage into the Gulf, Blaylock had had plenty of time to familiarize herself with the region. More than enough time, actually, since so little was actually known about it, other than its size, location, and strategic significance, or rather its lack thereof. It was well known however, that most of its sparse stellar population were not of the spectral types associated with habitable worlds. In the Geminis Gulf, young supergiant O-type stars predominated, the sort of suns whose huge mass blows them apart only a few hundred million years into their lifespans, rather than the cooler, more stable variety, such as the G-type star that sired Earth, and its immediate planetary neighbors. But the Geminis Gulf was important in at least one respect, it lay just outside the boundaries of both the Federation and the Romulan Star Empire, and it had yet to come formally into the sphere of influence of either power. Nearly smack in the center of the Gulf's unexplored vastness, lay one inhabited world, the fourth planet of the politically non-aligned Chiaro system. Under recently negotiated agreements, neither the Federation or the Romulans could establish a permanent presence in the Gulf until invited to do so, by a spacefaring civilization native to the Gulf. Blaylock was only too aware that her job was to do everything the Prime Directive would allow, to obtain that invitation from the Kairosans, who comprised the only warp-capable culture yet known in the Gulf, and thus were the key to the entire region, and to whatever awaited discovery within its confines. Never mind that there isn't any there, there, Blaylock thought, absurdly reminded of the 20th century human writer, Gertrude Stein's often mischaracterized description, of an empty region on Earth. Settling back into her chair, Blaylock smiled to herself. She had already reviewed the Kairosan government's preliminary application for Federation membership. Less than two weeks from now, the planet's general population would formally vote on whether to invite in the Romulans or the Federation. Fortunately, since the pro-Federation position was being staunchly backed by the planet's extremely popular ruling regime, it seemed to Blaylock that her mission was already all but accomplished. Blaylock therefore felt amply justified in allowing her thoughts to return to the matter of the mysterious subspace distortions, and their possible causes. Now that they had piqued her curiosity, she couldn't bear the thought of leaving the bridge for a diplomatic conference whose results were already foreordained. Just how important is the captain's presence at this conference, Blaylock said, turning toward Roger. Seated in the chair beside Blaylock's, Roger leaned forward, his mahogany-colored brow wrinkled in evident confusion. It's crucial, captain. The natives of Kiaros Four are a warrior people. If you're not there, they're likely to take offense. Her exec's discomfiture brought a small smile to her lips. Don't panic, Ernie. I'm not planning on going AWOL. What I mean is, how important is it that the captain be present with the first away team? Roger appeared to relax at that. Stroking his jaw, he said, it's not critical, I suppose. You have to remember though, that the Kairosans are very hierarchical and protocol conscious. So I noticed, Blaylock said. They've planned just about every minute of our itinerary while we're on their planet. And we won't even meet First Protector Roward until our third day on the planet. It's all just lower-level functionaries until then. When in Rome, Captain, Roger said. 
I agree. Therefore I've decided I'm staying aboard the Slayton until you finish up the preliminary business with the first away team. That'll give me at least another full day here on the bridge before I have to join you down on the planet. Roger smiled knowingly. You want to keep looking for those subspace distortions yourself. Blaylock didn't smile back. Roger needed to know that she was deadly serious. There's more at stake here than my scientific curiosity. We already know that the Romulans will have a delegation on Kiaros. That's unavoidable, unfortunately, under the treaties. Roger too, was no longer smiling. Wherever you find Romulan diplomats, you'll probably also find a cloaked Romulan ship nearby, certainly up to no good. Roger regarded her with a silent scowl. He was giving her the look again. She knew that he had to be thinking, a cloaked Romulan ship that causes intermittent subspace distortions that can be picked up five sectors away. Fortunately, Roger was not one to question her orders in front of the crew. Until I find out the answer, she told herself, I'll be damned if I'm off this ship one second longer than I absolutely have to be. At that moment, Zweller rose from his station and faced Blaylock, an eager expression on his face. Though he was in his sixties, his unbridled enthusiasm made him appear much younger. Captain. Yes, Mr. Zweller. If it's all right with you and Commander Roger, I'd like to be part of the first away team. From what I've read about Kiaros 4, the place could keep a dozen science officers busy for years. Blaylock looked toward her exec, who nodded his approval. She turned the matter over in her mind for a moment, then rose from her chair and regarded Zweller approvingly. She liked officers who weren't afraid to show a little initiative. All right, Mr. Zweller. Assemble a few of the department heads in the shuttle bay at 0800 tomorrow. You and Commander Roger will oversee the opening diplomatic ceremonies. Zweller thanked Blaylock, then returned to his station to contact his key subordinates. She had no doubt that Kiaros 4 would more than justify his scientific curiosity. For a moment, she regretted her decision not to lead the first away team. But she had a mystery to solve, and a ship to worry about. Needs must, Blaylock thought, when the devil drives. Or, the Romulans. Sitting beside Roger in the cockpit of the shuttlecraft Archimedes, Zweller finished his portion of the pre-flight systems checks in less than five minutes. The eight-person craft was ready for takeoff, even as the heads of the biomedical science, planetary studies, xenoanthropology, and engineering departments, took their seats. At Roger's command, the triple-layered duranium hangar doors opened, accentuating the faint blue glow of the shuttle bay's atmospheric force field. The shuttle rose on its antigravs, moved gently forward, and accelerated into the frigid vastness of space. The perpetually sunward side of Kiaros 4, suddenly loomed above the Archimedes, presenting a dazzling vista of ochres and browns. Gray, vaguely menacing clouds surged over the equatorial mountain ranges. High above the Terminator, separating eternal night from unending day, Zweller could see the glint of sunlight on metal, Kiaros 4's off-planet communications relay, tethered to the planet's narrow, habitable zone, by a network of impossibly slender-looking cables. Zweller noticed that the portion of the tether that plunged into the roiling atmosphere was surrounded by transitory flashes of light. Lightning, he wondered, then looked more closely. No, it's thruster fire. If the Kairosans didn't compensate somehow for the motions of their turbulent atmosphere, that orbital tether wouldn't last ten minutes. Zweller took in this vista, the untamable planet, as well as the tenacious efforts of the Kairosans to subdue it, with unfeigned delight. Hail the Kairosans, Mr. Zweller, Roger said, interrupting his reverie. Zweller complied, immediately all business once again. His hail was answered by a voice as deep as a canyon, which cleared the shuttlecraft to begin its descent into the churning atmosphere. The computer received the landing coordinates and projected a neat, elliptical course onto the central navigational display. A pity we can't just beam straight down to the capital, Roger said as the Slayton receded into the distance. Andreas Hearn, the Slayton's chief engineer, spoke up from directly behind Zweller. 
Between the radiation output of the Kairosan sun, the planet's intense magnetosphere, and the clash of hot and cold air masses down there, we can't even get a subspace signal down to the surface, at least not without the orbital tether relay. I wouldn't recommend trying to transport anyone directly through all that atmospheric hash. Oh enough technical talk, said Gomp, the Tellarite chief medical officer, who was seated in the cabin's aftmost section. I want to know what these people are really like. The only things I've seen so far are their official reports to the Federation. Medically speaking, all I can really say about them is that they're supposed to be triple-jointed, and faster than regular eelbirds. Then I wouldn't recommend challenging them on the hoverball court, Hearn said with a chuckle. The Archimedes entered the upper atmosphere. On the cockpit viewer, Sweller watched as an aurora reached across the planet's south pole with multicolored, phosphorescent fingers. Lightning split the clouds in the higher latitudes. Atmospheric friction increased, and an ionized plasma envelope began forming around the shuttle's hull. Gomp makes a good point, said xenoanthropologist, Liz Curlin, as though this didn't happen very often. All we know about these people so far is what they want us to know. So we'll start filling in those gaps in our knowledge today, Roger said with a good-natured shrug. That's why we're all here, isn't it? Sitting in silence, he moved his fingers with deliberate precision over the controls. Then, the shuttle hastened its descent toward the rapidly approaching Terminator, the demarcation line between the planet's endless frigid night and its ever-agitated, superheated sunward side. On the Slayton's bridge, Blaylock heard an uncharacteristic urgency enter Glebuck's voice. Captain. The anomaly has reappeared. The bridge crew suddenly began moving, in double time. Blaylock was on her feet in an instant. Location. Scanning, Glebuck said. Ensign Burdick, the young man at the forward science station, beat the Antidean to the answer. A massive subspace distortion wavefront has appeared, 4.8 astronomical units south of the planet's orbital plane. Speed? One-tenth light speed in all directions. Speed is constant. Transfer the coordinates to the helm, Blaylock said. Coordinates received, acknowledged Glebuck. That's our heading, helmsman. Engage at warp factor 2. Take us half an AU from the wavefront, then full stop. Close, but not too close. On my mark, get the hell away, at maximum warp. I, Glebeck said, altering the ship's speed and direction. Blaylock could feel the slight telltale vibration in the deck plates. Ensign Burdick, record everything you can about those subspace distortions, Blaylock barked, then whirled toward the tall, dark-tressed woman, who was working the aft communication station. Lieutenant Harding, try to raise the Archimedes. Precisely 16 seconds later, the Slayton had come to a full stop at a safe distance from the slowly expanding subspace effect. On the forward viewer, the starfield rippled slightly, as though attached to a curtain being blown by a strong wind. No contact with the Archimedes, Captain, Harding said. They must have already entered Kiaro's Four's atmosphere. Captain, Burdick suddenly cried out from the science station, getting Blaylock's full attention. The wavefront speed has just increased almost a hundredfold. How can that be? Blaylock thought in the space of a heartbeat. Unless the phenomenon has begun dropping in and out of normal space, gaining velocity from subspace. She wasted no time. Raise shields, she shouted. Glebuck, get us out of. The wavefront struck at that moment, instantly overwhelming the Slayton's inertial dampers. The bridge went dark and the deck lurched sideways, throwing Blaylock from her feet. Her body slammed hard into a railing, which she grabbed with both arms. She felt at least one of her ribs give way under the impact. A portside panel exploded in a bright shower of sparks, leaving tracers of light behind her eyelids. She heard a sharp scream cut through the alarm klaxons, then cease. The emergency lighting kicked in, casting an eerie, blood-colored pall across the bridge. The deck leveled itself. 
smoke billowed from a burning panel. Bodies lay sprawled everywhere, some moving, some not. The bridge viewer was dead. Blaylock noticed that Glebuk had been hurled forward over the helm console, and onto the deck. The Antidean lay still, water seeping from a tear in her hydration suit, her neck bent into an impossible question mark shape. Fighting down a surge of horror, Blaylock sat behind the helm console. The controls, resolutely refused to respond. What the hell was she dealing with, here? Blaylock spun her chair toward Burdick, whom Harding was helping back into his seat. Blood surged into the ensign's eyes, from a gash on his forehead. Status report, Blaylock snapped. Harding, the more experienced officer, began consulting a nearby undamaged instrument panel. The shields are down. We've got hull breaches all over the place and we're down to battery power. I need to see what's out there. Can you get that screen working, Lieutenant? I'm on it. Harding tapped a console at a furious pace. The bridge lights dimmed. Try not to lose the mood lighting, Zena, Blaylock said. Harding smiled weakly in response. The viewer came to life in a brief burst of static. Stars shone whitely, no longer distorted by the subspace phenomenon. And something else was there as well. A shape. Can you increase the magnification, Blaylock said. Harding nodded. The lights dimmed further and the half-seen shape resolved itself into lines of hard metal. It was a large, toroid-shaped ship, or perhaps it was a space station, circled by dozens, or perhaps hundreds, of much smaller objects. Buoys? Service modules of some sort? Why didn't we notice all of this when we entered the system, Blaylock said, turning toward Burdick and Harding. Blaylock saw that Burdick's eyes were glued to the screen. Pointing a shaking finger, he said, maybe because they didn't want us to. Blaylock was unsurprised to see the ominous, double-bladed shape of a Romulan warbird, rippling into existence on the viewer. I hate being right all the time, she thought mirthlessly. The Slayton had to be well within the range of the decloaking warship's weapons. The Romulan vessel was more than twice the Slayton's size, and her disruptor ports glowed with menace. And the Slayton was dead in space. But Blaylock told herself that the warbird's captain wouldn't harbor any hostile intent. With so little really known about the Geminus Gulf, why would the Romulans want to risk starting a war over it? Then, the warbird fired. The Slayton lurched again, and the lights failed once more. Blaylock wondered how long it would take for the warp core to lose antimatter containment. And just what it was the Romulans knew about this place, that she didn't. The bridge flared into cerulean brilliance a moment later, followed immediately, by more blackness. This time, the dark was absolute and eternal. The Archimedes continued its descent, through Chiaro's four storm-tossed, dayside atmosphere. Zweller ignored the low conversational murmurs passing between the department heads, and concentrated on his piloting chores. Though the inertial dampers succeeded in cancelling out most of the turbulence, Zweller could still feel the deck shimmying slightly beneath his boots. And the structural integrity field was being taxed far more than usual. Adjusting the viewer to compensate for the ball of white-hot plasma that now completely surrounded the shuttle's hull, Zweller quietly admired the savage beauty of the landscape quickly scrolling by below. It was a place of immiscible contrasts, irresistible forces in perpetual stalemate. It was a place he could understand. As the Archimedes entered the nightward terminator, Zweller reduced the craft's velocity, lowering the hull temperature and making the plasma fires gutter out. He brought the shuttle down toward a range of cheerless brown mountains and arced into a northeasterly heading. In seconds, the craft cleared the peaks, and the relentlessly baked dayside gave way to a fog-shrouded valley. Auroral flashes arced repeatedly across the sky, leaping the planet's everlasting twilight belt, momentarily linking day, with night. The vapor dispersed as the ground grew nearer, and unveiled a quiltwork of hardscrabble farmland and narrow roads. Small settlements and isolated dwellings hove into view and just as quickly passed away. 
A great cityscape glittered in the haze, barely perceptible on the northern horizon. It appeared to fade toward a tumble of dry hills and barren escarpments that extended into the planet's dark side as far as Sweller could see. Lights twinkled across the city's remote nightward periphery. Looks like we found the planet's single worthwhile piece of real estate, Domp said with a porcine chortle. Finishing a long countdown in his head, Sweller thought, it's time. An alarm light suddenly flashed on Zweller's console, and a klaxon brayed a warning. The tactical display at Zweller's left side came to life. What is it, Roger said, sounding cautious, though not particularly alarmed. I think we're about to have some company, said Zweller. A Kairosan honor guard, Hearn ventured. Zweller felt his jaw clenching involuntarily. I, I don't think so. Shields up. Roger shouted. Red alert. Something struck the shuttle at that moment, making the hull reverberate like an enormous bell. The engineer and the doctor fell into a heap atop Liz Curlin. Tim Tui, the head of planetary studies, helped Gomp get his hooves beneath him. Everyone scrambled back into their seats and activated the crash harnesses. The shuttle rocked again, more violently than before, as though punched by a giant. His harness kept Sweller from being spilled from his seat. Though partly obscured by static, the tactical display showed a fast-approaching trio of small, aggressively contoured vessels. They appeared to be fighter craft of an unusual configuration. Sweller recognized them as Kairosan. Status, Roger shouted, trying to compete with the rumbling of the hull. Shields and weapons are offline, Sweller said. I can't keep anything working with all this atmospheric ionization. A static-swept male voice, deep and harsh, emanated from the comm system. Federation shuttle, you will follow our lead vessel's navigation beam into nightside. Consider yourselves our prisoners. Roger spat a nearly inaudible curse before replying. We are here on a diplomatic mission at the invitation of First Protector Roward, the head of this world's duly elected government. On whose authority have you attacked us? Had we attacked you, you would be dead, came the reply. You are in the custody of the Army of Light. If you attempt to resist or flee, we will not hesitate to destroy your vessel. Roger made a slashing gesture, and Zweller responded by temporarily interrupting the audio. Make best speed for the capital, Mr. Zweller, Roger said. There are bound to be official patrols there who can drive these characters off. Zweller shook his head emphatically. They're right on top of us, sir. We'll never make it. The shuttle lurched again and the hull braces groaned. Zweller watched the structural integrity telltale dip into the red. A near miss, Zweller thought, a direct hit probably would have breached the hull and blown everyone out of the shuttle. The lights flickered as the battery-powered backup life support system kicked in. Roger's frown could have curdled milk. You don't seem to be trying very goddamned hard, mister. Raising an eyebrow, Sweller ignored the comment. I don't think our welcoming committee enjoys being kept waiting, sir. After pausing to glare at Sweller, Roger tapped a command into the console, relinquishing control of the shuttle's navigational computer to their captors. He turned toward the somber group in the seats behind him. Looks like we're taking an unscheduled detour, folks. Never a cop around when you need one, Gomp muttered. Nobody laughed. The Archimedes abruptly banked and descended even farther. The shuttle barely cleared the hills beyond the sprawling city's nightward side, as she continued into utter blackness, flanked by her escorts. Kiaros 4 had no natural satellites, and possessed a thick cloud canopy, conditions that made nightside quite dark, except when the clouds were riven by lightning and auroral fireworks. The Archimedes trajectory however, stayed mostly within the swirls of the clouds blown in from dayside, cover that made the auroras, and therefore the ground, difficult to see, from the shuttle's windows. The few flashes of light that did enter the cabin, merely served to prevent the crew's eyes from adjusting to the darkness. To the hapless occupants of the Archimedes, 
Nightside appeared more tenebrous than the inside of any tomb. After crossing the Terminator into night, the Archimedes flew for more than an hour, changing directions sharply several times, banking and spiraling. Whether because of atmospheric effects or damage sustained in the attack, the onboard instruments couldn't determine the shuttle's location or even its altitude. Sitting behind his useless control panel, Zweller realized that he might as well have been blindfolded. Roger and the department heads somberly discussed their options, including whether or not they ought to open the weapons locker and put up some real resistance after landing. Though Gomp was the loudest proponent of the stand-and-fight notion, Zweller suspected that it was all rhetoric. He'd never met a Tellarite who didn't prefer a loud, abusive argument to actual combat. After everyone had spoken his piece, Roger announced that they were to forget about fighting their way out of this situation, after all, they had come to conduct diplomacy, not warfare. They received a hail, and the crew cabin fell silent. Prepare to land, said the harsh voice of their captor over the background of static. A pattern of lights appeared on the ground, perhaps a quarter of a kilometer below the shuttle. Roger tried to turn the landing over to the computer, but it again failed to respond. Zweller tripped the manual override and began bringing the craft down, aiming for the center of the landing pattern. A moment after the shuttle came to rest, the ground itself began to sink. Enormous mechanisms groaned as the surface beneath the shuttle lowered into a dimly illuminated subterranean chamber. Zweller watched on the viewer as a metal roof quickly rolled into place about eight meters overhead, shutting out what could be seen of the obsidian sky. I'll bet this place is completely invisible from the air, Gomp said, sounding impressed. Very neat. A bank of bright lights flared to life along the chamber's ceiling, revealing its enormous size. Several small fighter craft of the same type as their attackers were parked nearby. Perhaps twenty large, armed humanoids were taking up positions surrounding the Archimedes. Curlin and Tui both gazed significantly at the weapons locker, and then back at Roger, as if to say, this is our last chance. No phasers, Roger reiterated, and the rest of the human officers nodded their assent. Gaunt spat a monosyllabic Tellarite curse. Roger fixed a steely gaze on Zweller, but Zweller met it, unblinkingly. Commander Zweller and I will go out first, Roger said. Unarmed. Hearn opened the shuttle's hatch manually, then stepped aside. Roger walked through it, to meet their captors. Zweller followed, the planet slightly higher than Earth normal gravity, making his feet, feel leaden. From what Zweller knew of Kairosans, the soldiers of the Army of Light, were fairly typical representatives of the species. A robust people, none of them were shorter than two meters. Zweller was immediately struck by the strangeness of their eyes, which were the color of iridescent cobalt, and had an almost crystalline appearance. Though broad in the shoulders, the Kairosans were whipcord lean, their bare arms striated with muscles like steel cables, and half covered with a fine, brown fur. The hairless portions of their skins resembled burnished copper, and shined almost as brightly as the long curved blades that hung from the sashes of their gray uniforms. Their obvious strength was complemented by a fluid grace of motion, as though their musculoskeletal systems were capable of an impossibly wide range of motion. If one of these guys had helped us against those Nausicans back in 27, old Johnny Picard never would have needed that artificial heart. The troops wasted no time escorting everyone off of the shuttle. After taking the Starfleet officers' comm badges, and searching them for weapons, as well as confiscating the phasers they had left aboard the Archimedes, the Kairosans manacled the wrists of each of their six captives. The soldiers then frog-marched them out of the hangar complex, down a lengthy, narrow corridor, and then into a second large chamber. Several slim ceiling-mounted illumination panels, bathed the room in a dull white light. Zweller's gaze took in the room's bare stone walls and floor, which were adorned with edged weapons, as well as paintings and sculptures depicting what must have been important battles and revered war heroes, from the annals of Kairosan history. A pair of bare-chested Kairosan males, faced one another in the center of the room, 
neither of them acknowledging the presence of the Starfleet prisoners. The larger, and more striking of the pair, was yellow-haired. The smaller, darker Kairosan, appeared no less formidable, however. Both of them held long, curved blades in each of their hands, and were in the midst of sparring, their graceful, triple-jointed movements reminding Zweller of Japanese kata. Their limbs moved with unbelievable control and precision, almost faster than the eye could follow. Though their weapons clanged together forcefully, often striking sparks, both men obviously were exerting tremendous discipline over both blade and sinew. It occurred to Zweller that the trio of guards standing behind them were largely superfluous, present only to provide additional intimidation. Stepping inside the guard of the darker, smaller swordsman, the yellow-haired fighter suddenly trapped his opponent's thick neck between his blades. Though both men abruptly froze in place, Zweller half expected the victor to snip the other man's head off, like a gardener trimming a shrub. Instead, the winner sheathed his blades after a moment, and the other man followed suit. The fighters bowed to one another. Shaking perspiration from his abundant hair, the winner of the contest turned toward the Starfleet contingent. The Kairosan's head made the motion first, turning almost 180 degrees before the rest of his body followed. He greeted his guests with a smile made eerie by his preternaturally wide mouth and his razor-sharp, silver-hued teeth. Clear water and rich soil to you, my guests, he said in heavily accented but intelligible Federation standard. Please allow me to thank you for coming among us. You didn't give us a great deal of choice in the matter, Roger said, his face an impassive mask. The blonde Kairosan chuckled. His sparring partner merely stared belligerently at the captured officers. My name is Falhaim, and I command the Army of Light, the yellow-haired Kairosan said. Allow me to introduce Grelin, my good right hand. Zweller heard Gomp muttering behind him. And here I am without my dress uniform. Shut the hell up, Gomp, Tui hissed. Sullenly, Gomp complied. Fortunately, Falhain appeared to be ignoring everyone except for Zweller and Roger, perhaps sensing from their body language that they were the senior officers present. Or maybe, Zweller thought, the Kairosan rebels are familiar with Starfleet rank insignia. As you may have gathered, Falhain said, my people are having, difficulty, accepting our government's plan to enter the Federation. Zweller opened his mouth to reply, but Roger beat him to it. Sir, abducting Federation citizens is hardly a constructive way to air your grievances. Desperate times prescribe desperate tactics, Grelin said, his eyes narrowing to slits. Falhain nodded toward his lieutenant, then locked a humorless gaze upon Roger. I will cut straight to the heart of our grievances, as you so trivially characterize them, Roward, our world's duly elected leader, leads a government of murderers. Sweller tensed. His superiors had not included that information in his mission briefing. What are you talking about, he said. I'm talking about unanimity, my honored guests, Falhain said. The kind of unanimity that earns a Planet Federation membership. My people are paying the price for that unanimity. With their lives. I'm afraid I don't understand, Roger said, shaking his head. I speak for many of the outlying tribes and clans, a tiny minority of this planet's population, to be sure, but a people who prize their tradition of independence. That independence is unpopular in the capital, where we are seen as little better than vermin who compete with the cities for water and arable land, which our world gives to no one in abundance. The Federation can help you resolve those problems, if you let us, Roger said. Besides, your alternative is far worse. The Romulan Empire isn't likely to respect your people's independence. Falhain laughed mirthlessly. The Romulans have never frightened us. Nor have they ever tried to conquer us. We have nothing that they want, Grelin said. Maybe Roward and her ministers don't believe that, Zweller said. After all, the Romulans always want something. Perhaps, Falhain said. But none of that matters. What does matter, is that the Federation has allied itself with an ender of bloodlines. His eyes as cold as a nightside storm, Grelin addressed Zweller. 
For the past six years, Ruward's people have been trying to extinguish the clans, to increase the city's share of our scarce subsistence resources. At last count, this has cost my people over 600,000 lives. Only a small fraction of that number survive to fight on and avenge the murder. What is your word for it, human, Falhain said to Roger, who was blanching visibly. Genocide? Zweller swallowed hard, taking in the enormity of Falhain's charges. If they were true, then how much worse could Romulan rule actually be for these people? So now you're abducting non-combatants, Roger said. Falhain bared his teeth, making Zweller think of a cornered animal. Unlike Roward, we have at least confined our targets to those wearing uniforms. And as long as the Army of Light answers to me, we will continue to strike only at the guilty. We are even prepared to listen to Roward's honeyed words of peace, Grelin said with a sneer, his anthracite hard gaze engaging Falhain's. Even though doing so may well be an exercise in futility. Moving too quickly to see, Falhain's hands flew to the halves of his blades, making plain his intended response to any further challenge to his authority. Grelin remained as still as a statue for several protracted heartbeats, then backed slowly away. But Sweller could see that fire still burned in the dark-haired warrior's eyes. Falhain won't be able to keep that good right hand of his tied behind his back forever. The rebel chieftain relaxed his posture, and turned his cold gaze once again upon Roger and Zweller. My people are not bandits, humans. But we are, determined. We will achieve peace either at the talking table, or with the sword. Then, Falhain brought his impossibly limber elbows quickly together, a motion that produced an alarmingly loud noise, which was half whistle and half sandpaper rasp. Responding immediately, the guards hustled the sextet of Starfleet officers out of the room. Sweller was the first to be separated from the others. Almost an hour after the meeting with Falhain had concluded, one of the guards escorted Sweller from a rock-walled holding cell and ushered him into a small, darkened office. A pneumatic door hissed shut behind him. Sweller was now unguarded, though still manacled. He approached the door through which he had entered. It remained solidly closed. Zweller guessed that the guard had locked it from the outside. He heard a footfall behind him, and turned quickly toward the noise. Lights, said an aristocratic male voice, and the chamber's illumination immediately rose to a faint twilight level. A tall, ramrod straight figure stepped into view from the shadows of an alcove. He had straight raven black hair, combed forward, and the tips of his ears came to graceful points. His upswept eyebrows lent an air of expectation to his expression, as though he were a man accustomed to receiving satisfactory answers to his every question. He wore a grey and black Romulan military uniform, which was unadorned except for the emblem on his collar. The stylized sigil conjured for Zweller, a mental image of a voracious, predatory bird. Commander Corton Zweller stood facing Koval, the chairman of the Tal Shiar, the Romulan Star Empire's much-feared intelligence bureau, an agency which even members of the Romulan Senate, crossed only at their peril. Zweller held his shackled hands up. Koval spoke a terse command to the computer on his desk. The manacles dropped to the floor and Zweller gently rubbed his wrists to restore their circulation. Manik Narath Brahan Bora, Zweller said, a phrase that meant, good morning, Mr. Chairman, in the other man's language. Sometimes it was a good idea to remind an adversary that his secrets might not be as safe as he thinks, especially an adversary with whom one expects to do business. Koval raised an eyebrow slightly, then replied in perfect Federation standard. Morning. An odd choice of words, Commander Zweller, considering where we are. But I must compliment you. Your accent is virtually undetectable. Section 31 trains its operatives well indeed. He bowed his head almost imperceptibly. Zweller failed to suppress a wry smile. Conversational Romulan 101, he thought. Aloud, he offered, all part of the service. And likewise, I'm sure. Then let us avoid any further irrelevancies and proceed directly to the business at hand. 
A moment, please, Zweller said, carefully holding the Romulan's gaze. About my colleagues. Koval looked impatient for a fleeting moment. Falhain is having each of them interrogated. They are being held separately. And as far as any of them know, you are receiving precisely the same treatment. Zweller was relieved to learn that his cover wasn't blown, though he knew he would still have to mend his fences with Commander Roger. But even though Zweller appreciated Koval's professional courtesy, he knew it was never wise to mince words with a Romulan. Especially this Romulan. Thank you, Zweller said. May I also presume I have your guarantee that they won't be injured or harmed in any way? Koval paused for a moment before responding. You have my word. None of the officers we captured will suffer any injury while they are here. Though his eyes were dilithium hard, the Romulan spymaster's expression was otherwise unreadable. Then Koval moved on to other matters. Now let us discuss our transaction. I am prepared to keep my part of that bargain. Are you? The list, Zweller thought. Who knew how many lives Section 31 would save by acquiring a list of Tal Shiar agents operating covertly, not only within Starfleet, but also in civilian institutions across the Federation? Zweller nodded. Of course. With my help, Falhain and his troops will nudge the coming planetary vote on Federation membership, to the side of the minority pro-Romulan factions. Then the Chiaro system will become a Romulan protectorate. Koval nodded impassively. I'm certain that my, indigenous clients, will be delighted to accept your assistance. Zweller kept thinking about the spy list. It would constitute a substantial countermeasure against Romulan espionage, even though the list would almost certainly be incomplete. Koval was no fool, after all. Still, the only cost to Section 31 would be the Geminus Gulf, a few worthless, backwater sectors of trackless interstellar desert. Zweller agreed with Section 31's higher echelons, that they had struck a good bargain. But still. I have to ask you, Mr. Chairman, why do you really want this system? Koval seemed more annoyed by the question than surprised. Zweller doubted whether much of anything surprised him. Simple survival. Commander. When a state's boundaries remain static, it will eventually die. Is that not reason enough? If I may say so, the Geminus Gulf hardly seems worth the effort. I could reverse the question, Commander. After all, under our agreements, either we expand into the Gulf, or you do. Why should your benevolent federation begrudge our expansion into an admittedly resource-poor region? A region which you yourself have called worthless. Koval's eyes flashed with a preacher's fervor as he continued. Allow me to speak plainly, Commander. Whether you accept it or not, your Federation is as bent on conquest and assimilation as the Borg Collective. Oh, you are quiet about it. You shroud your acquisitiveness behind lofty-sounding ideals, the vaunted civil rights of your citizens, your renowned respect and tolerance of other cultures, your so-called, prime directive. But your federation has expanded greatly in every direction over the past century. 150 worlds. 8,000 light-years from border to border. And still you want more. What you cannot conquer with starships you take by subversion. You subtly change the cultures you encounter to suit yourselves. Your alliance with the Klingon Empire is a shining example, Commander. You've remade them in your own image. Koval allowed himself a brief smile. Why, thanks to the Federation, the Klingons are practically housebroken. Zweller chuckled, shaking his head. I had no idea you were such a political hardliner, Mr. Chairman. I had hoped that you'd agreed to cooperate with us because you wished the Federation well. Koval's only response was the small, fleeting smile that played at the corners of his mouth. Then he touched the emblem on his collar, activating a tiny communications unit. Please inform Falhain that his presence is requested for a high-level briefing to be conducted with one of our guests. A deep voice tersely acknowledged Koval's transmission. Then, folding his hands behind his back, Koval spoke again to Zweller. 
A wise man knows when it is best to allow his adversaries to speculate about his motivations. And so does a good spy, Sweller thought. As a single guard entered the room, no doubt to conduct him to the briefing, Sweller knew with certainty that he had just made a deal with the devil. He only hoped that, unlike Faust, he'd still have his soul after the bargain was complete. End of Part 1 This book will be released in segments each week on our YouTube channel, free of charge. However, to help support the costs involved in creating this audiobook, the entire book is available now to our Patreon supporters. If you would like to listen to the entire book early, please visit patreon.com slash yjk audiobooks. The link is also available in the video description below. And now, please enjoy a preview of our Patreon exclusive book series, Starfleet Academy. Star Trek Starfleet Academy Book 1 Crisis on Vulcan Written by Brad and Barbara Strickland Audiobook Adaptation by YJK Audiobooks Preview A young Spock accompanies his father, the Vulcan diplomat Sarek, to help negotiate a peace treaty. Once the treaty is signed, they board the starship Enterprise, to return home. But when the treaty is sabotaged by rebel forces, Spock may be the only one who can save a planet, from war. Chapter 1 Two suns, hung low in a turquoise sky. The higher one was a bloated crimson, a squashed red oval, that gave little warmth. The lower sun, was merely a brilliant point of blue-white light. Across a vast, nearly flat plain, of harshly glittering crystalline rock, almost exactly the corroded copper-green color of Spock's blood, the horizon became jagged. A range of cobalt-blue volcanic cones thrust their sharp peaks upward, and each mountain cast two sharp-edged shadows on the plain, one shadow a deep violet, the other paler one, gray-green. Almost directly overhead, an irregular buttery yellow crescent moon rode waves of crimson, orange, and purple aurora, the shimmering colors as restless as an ocean. Off in the east, a smaller, rounder gray moon had just risen above the roof of the Bel Tahan Conference Center, where fifty diplomats worked to end a war that had gone on for generations. In the darker sky above the sleek building, a few random stars already glittered, their light dimmed in the auroral display. High meteors, their trails brilliant white, scratched across the western sky. It is all very, began Cha Tuan Mar Lorval, the Marathan youth who had only a few weeks before set foot on his ancestral planet for the first time in his life. The short, stumpy boy hesitated, searching for the right words. It is very, very fascinating, said Spock. Cha turned his head, his mane of iridescent hair glimmering in the double light of the setting binary suns. No. I was trying to say beautiful but in a more intense way. It is more beautiful than anything I have ever seen. The Marathon boy stole a quick glance back at the Bel Tahan complex, lowered his voice, and murmured, it is a vision given us by the ancient maker. Spock raised an eyebrow. The ancient maker. With an embarrassed shrug, Cha looked away. I am almost an adult. Such things are forbidden. I cannot speak of them. Ah, a religious taboo, Spock said. I will not question you. Cha relaxed. Thank you. But surely even one who is without the knowledge of the ancient maker can see the glory, the beauty, of all this. Spock tilted his head as he considered. The air of Merith was thin, and at this latitude, bitterly cold in his nostrils. He took a deep breath. The arrangement of the landscape and the placement of astronomical bodies is aesthetically attractive, he admitted. Though of course it is temporary. The most interesting point for me is the double sun. Merith is one of the few inhabited planets that orbits a double star. 
Most binary system planets orbit one of the two suns but not both. Cha shook his head. You Vulcans have no soul, he complained. You're all logic and mathematics and science. You don't appreciate the, the poetry, of such a vision. He nodded toward the west. The larger sun, the reddish one, is Hamarka, the creator, the one my people call, the ancient maker. The small, brilliant point of blue-white light, the one that dances around Hamarka, is Valash, the jester. Spock nodded. He noted again that he was cold. Merith was not a particularly cold planet, it was even warmer than Vulcan in the lower latitudes, but Beltahan, an ancient religious and cultural center, was close to Merith's North Pole. After 18 years of learning Vulcan discipline though, Spock was used to ignoring mere physical discomfort. It sounds as if the two suns are part of a myth, he suggested. Yes, responded Cha. He shifted his feet, making the short columns of frost crunch and crackle. I can tell you that. I am not yet of age, and the stories are not part of the true lore. In the beginning, they were alone, then Valash challenged Hamarka to bring forth some new thing in the universe. It was to be a thing to make them both laugh if Hamarka could do that. Then with a thought, Hamarka created Merith, the world, and all the life upon her, just to amuse the two friends. Is that not a pretty story? It is a standard creation myth, Spock pointed out. Sensing that his observation might create some unfavorable emotion in the other boy, he added, although the story is most unusual in its assumption that the universe was created as a, we have no Vulcan term for the concept, but an earth word is, joke. Cha walked a few meters away, leaving a trail of dark footprints against the frost, and sat on a rounded boulder. He huddled into his heavy jacket, for even to someone whose ancestors came from Merith, the afternoon was growing uncomfortably chilly. Already the distant blue volcanoes had begun to show long jagged streaks of white frost. It is a bitter joke, he said softly. A joke, that drove my people away from our homeworld, in the time of my great-grandfather's fathers, great-grandfathers. Marathons had a curious way of measuring historical periods. Spock looked at his friend. They had only met a few weeks ago, but they had learned they could talk easily to one another. Cha's father, Karos Mar Santor, was a diplomatic assistant in the Shakir mission to the homeworld. Since Spock's father, Sarek, was an accomplished diplomat himself, the two young men had much in common. Spock had no doubt that Sarek would succeed in drawing the three factions together, for his father had infinite patience and a gift for directing negotiations in the most logical channels. Still, the problem was complex and delicate. Merith, the planet on which Spock and Cha stood, was the second world from the binary star in a seven-planet system. For many centuries, different nations had existed on Merith, almost always at war. The constant warfare had many causes, struggles for territory, struggles for power, even conflicts over points of religion. More than 500 years earlier, scientists on Merith, working to create new and terrible weapons, had developed space flight. The weapon became a means of escape when a fierce global war broke out. Outcasts from the homeworld of Merith settled first two moons of Gandar, the third planet in the system. Gandar was a swollen gas giant with eleven major moons, two of them large enough to support life. Another group of refugees sheltered on distant Shakir, the fourth world in the system, a planet almost inhospitably cold, except for its equatorial region. Shakir was Cha's home. And now that scientists on Shakir had developed a primitive form of warp drive, they had encountered hostile Klingons uncomfortably close to them in space. Suddenly, all the enemy factions in the system had a new foe to dread. The Marathon system had applied to become part of the United Federation of Planets. The Federation was willing, but only if the Marathons could finally resolve their old hostilities. Sarek had launched the historic peace effort that now, after three years of diplomatic struggle, was finally on the verge of producing a treaty, and, everyone hoped, a lasting peace. Cha turned to say something to Spock, blinked, and gestured toward the conference center. Look. Spock glanced over his left shoulder, 
and noted that all the lights were on, every light inside and outside the building, shone with a clear white glare. They have achieved accord, he murmured. The agreement has been reached. Cha came to stand beside Spock. Yes, he said, his voice surprisingly tense. Raising an eyebrow, Spock studied Cha's profile. The Marathan teen's features showed no pleasure. They were set in a scowl of, discontent. Anger. Emotions were so hard to read, thought Spock. Especially the emotions of aliens. I wish you satisfaction in the agreement, Spock said. Cha did not look at him. We'd better go in, he said. The warmth of the conference center was welcome after the chilly afternoon. An aide offered both Spock and Cha a tall tubular glass with a few centimeters of tashik, a hot marathon drink. They accepted and quickly gulped the fiery orange liquid, as was polite. It tasted both sweet and bitter, and the spices in it were surprisingly hot. As the steaming drink warmed him from inside, Spock looked around. Dozens of people stood in the grand hall, clustered in groups of six or seven. At last Spock saw his father, Sarek, at the center of one of these groups. The tall, dignified Vulcan towered above the stocky marathons around him. As the two boys maneuvered toward him, Spock noticed that one of the marathons standing near Sarek was Cha's father, Karos Mar Santor. Like his son, Karos looked tense and unhappy. His mane of hair, even more impressive than his son's, had lost some of its luster, and the rainbow colors were muted, but Karos was a healthy, vigorous man. As he spoke to Sarek, he gave the impression of great energy under weak control. Spock wondered what emotion Karos felt. Was the word angry? Or was it a different feeling? Spock could only guess. Sarek nodded a greeting as Spock and Cha drew near. Welcome, my son. Good afternoon, young Mar. Cha murmured some pleasantry, and then spoke to his own father. Well? The majority have approved a treaty, Caro said shortly, his voice harsh, rasping. We will not speak of it now. But, father. We will talk of it later, snapped Karos. The abruptness of Karos's manner surprised Spock. Like his son, Karos was an easygoing, humorous individual. True, Spock had come to realize that even a being who enjoyed laughter could be very serious indeed when dealing with matters of importance. And it was equally true that the negotiations had lasted for a long time and had been most demanding. And yet. And yet something more was wrong. Spock could sense it in the tension between father and son, in the hopeless but determined glare Cha gave the older Marathan, in the way they both turned abruptly and walked away. Spock moved to his father's side. Have you reached a satisfactory accord? Sarek replied, we have at least forged a treaty. It recognizes the unity of the Marathan peoples but grants sovereignty to each group. No side is completely satisfied with it. Then it is not a good treaty. Sarek gave his son a considering look, the faintest hint of warmth in his eyes. On the contrary, Spock. The best treaty always leaves every party a little unsatisfied, because all must surrender something of importance in order for the whole group to gain. I will remember that. The groups had rearranged themselves, with heated but quiet conversations going on all around the room. Outside both suns had set, and the sky had grown quite dark. Merith was near a cluster of bright stars, or rather was within a few dozen light years of them, and some were so brilliant that Spock could see them through the glass windows, even with the interior of the conference center radiant with light. In a far corner, Cha and his father had joined a group of negotiators from Shakir, the cold outpost of the Marathan civilization. They kept looking Sarek's way, and none of the looks were friendly. One of them, a grim-looking elderly Marathan, whose hair had faded to silvery blue, turned his craggy, wrinkled face toward the two Vulcans and scowled at them. The hum and murmur of conversation were urgent and low. Father, Spock said, the Shakir delegation appears to have strong reservations about the treaty. Yes, responded Sarek with a sigh. The old man is Hulmanak Lasvor, 
a rebel leader in the space war fought between Shakir and Merith, 30 years ago. He was opposed to any agreement, and in some ways, the other members of the Shakir delegation agreed with him. They wished to include some concessions that the Marathan delegation refused, chiefly having to do with rites of passage to and from the homeworld. It was a serious block to negotiation, and at last I was able to overcome it only by specifying in the treaty that such questions will be resolved through more negotiations over the next ten standard years. After a pause, Sarek added, I do not fully understand the heat with which the diplomats argued this problem. Strong emotions enter into it, and the Marathons are most reluctant to explain their reasons to an outsider. I have noticed that, father. The two Vulcans were walking toward a bank of turbolifts that would take them to their quarters. Still, a treaty of any sort will help the Marathons in their application to join the Federation, will it not? They stepped into the turbolift, and Sarek said, Habitation level, Diplomatic Guest Quarters 1. To Spock he said, The treaty will do much more than that, my son. You must understand what has happened here. Thanks to diplomacy, the system has avoided bloodshed and war. That is an accomplishment of great merit in itself. And perhaps they have taken a first step, a small step, toward becoming truly one people. That is an even greater accomplishment. Do you understand me? The turbolift sighed to a stop, and father and son got out. The corridor into which they stepped was softly lit, arched, and silent. They walked toward their rooms as Spock slowly answered, I believe I do understand, father. You have taught the Marathons the value of diplomacy, the logic of settling their disputes bloodlessly. You have given them a start on the path to full civilization. Not I, Sarek gently corrected his son. The Vulcan way of logic. I am only the instrument of logic on Merith. Spock, I want you to consider how rare logic is in the universe. Our scientists believe there are hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, of sentient races in the galaxy. What is the norm among them? War, hatred, bigotry, force. What is the greatest good we can do for them? To teach them there is a way out. The way our forebears discovered, in the control of emotion and the use of logic. The door sensed their approach, identified them as the occupants of the rooms it guarded, and silently opened for them. They stepped inside, and the lights immediately came on. Spock said slowly, Yes, father. I understand. Good. Sarek sighed. I know your gifts, Spock. You wish to be a scientist, and you have won a great honor in being admitted to the Science Academy on Vulcan. However, remember that a good diplomat may also be a good scientist. The universe is full of warring peoples, and many of them live on planets that our science has neither discovered nor described. After a moment of silence, Spock said, Are we to return home now, father? The way Sarek looked at him might have made a human teen anxious, for it was a glance that clearly said Sarek had grasped Spock's strong desire to change the subject. But Spock was only half-human, and his Vulcan side enabled him to do away with anxiety. Well, almost. Sarek said, yes, now we will prepare to return home. The treaty will not be official until transmission to the United Federation of Planets, for archiving and verification. The little work that remains can be done by subspace communication. We must prepare to leave tomorrow. Tomorrow, Spock asked, not managing to hide the surprise in his voice. So soon. Yes. A Federation ship has entered orbit around Merith, and it will transport the Marathan offworlders to their own homes. It will also take us to Vulcan, so we need not call for a Vulcan ship. I see. And what is the ship? asked Spock. I did not make a point of asking its name. A ship is a ship, replied Sarek. After a moment, he said, though now that I think of it, I did overhear some marathons speaking of it. I believe the ship we are to take is called, Enterprise. Chapter 2 The cloud-streaked turquoise sky, the level plain, 
the misty distant blue volcanoes of Merith, shimmered away, and a moment later, a dim, cool cubicle shimmered into existence. Sarek stepped down from the transporter platform, and Spock followed him. A young human man, dressed in the greenish-gold tunic of a Starfleet command officer, left the console from which he had operated the transporter controls. Ambassador Sarek, Mr. Spock, welcome aboard the Enterprise. I am First Officer Christopher Pike. The captain will be pleased to see you. Sarek inclined his head. And I, to see him. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Pike. Captain April wanted me to show you to your quarters, Pike said. He thought you might want to accustom yourselves to our gravity and atmosphere for an hour or so. He will meet you at 1100, if that is agreeable. Certainly, Sarek said. They left the transporter room and walked down a curving corridor. The first thing Spock noticed was the gravity, lighter than that of Merith, far lighter than that of Vulcan. He moved carefully, accustoming himself to his new weight. Crew members, men and women, hurried past them, giving them inquisitive but friendly glances as they passed. I understand that congratulations are in order for young Spock, Pike said, as they took the lift to the accommodations deck. It isn't every 18-year-old Vulcan who receives an unconditional appointment to the Vulcan Science Academy. Spock gravely inclined his head. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Pike. I did not realize my acceptance was news. Oh, certainly, Pike said. Your father is a gifted diplomat, and those of us in Starfleet are grateful to him. The Marathon system is a real weak spot in our border with the Klingon Empire, and Sarek's work will make the Federation much more secure. Naturally we're interested in all the news about him, and in his son. You must be excited about attending the Science Academy. No, Spock said honestly. I am, gratified, but not excited. Of course, Pike said with a grin. Excitement is a human emotion. I forgot for a second. Well, here you are, adjoining cabins. Your luggage has already been brought here. I'm afraid it's a little plain, but the Enterprise has been called on to fight battles more than to transport honored guests. I hope these will be all right. They fulfill their function admirably, Sarek said. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Pike. You're quite welcome. Pike indicated a wall-mounted device. If you wish to set the environmental controls to something more like a Vulcan atmosphere, just call engineering on the intership communicator here. I will come for you shortly before 1100 hours and escort you to the captain's conference room. Thank you. I shall use the interval to meditate. As Pike turned to leave, Spock said, Father. May I see the ship? Sarek replied, That is up to Lieutenant Commander Pike. Sure, Pike said. Come along. As they walked along the curving corridor, Spock breathed deeply and looked around. The atmosphere was ideal for a human crew, but to someone used to the thin air of Vulcan, it was incredibly rich with aromas, lubricants, faint hints of protein and fruit as they passed a dining area, undertones of minerals, and a strong tang of oxygen. Like to see the engine room? asked Pike. That would be most gratifying, Spock returned. Their tour started there. Assistant Engineer Wellborn welcomed them, showed them the dilithium containment chambers, the reactor coils, and the power controls, and explained about Cochrane warp generators. Spock listened politely, never once indicating that he knew all about these rather elementary processes. Pike then took him to the Xenobiology Labs, the Sensor Control Center, and finally, suggested returning to the transporter room. The Marathons are coming aboard, he explained. We're giving some of them a lift to their homeworlds. I think we'll just have time to see them aboard before your father has his appointment with Captain April. They returned to the same transporter room where Spock and Sarek had beamed aboard. Pike took his position behind the control console and explained the principles behind the matter transport device. I understand that Vulcan scientists have helped to refine this invention, he said as he finished. Spock nodded. Yes. The biological pattern buffer has been made much more reliable thanks to Sunak of Vulcan. 
Prior to his invention, the transporter was only 99.9992% accurate in transporting living subjects. Thanks to Sunik's incorporation of Vulcan uncertainty physics, it is now virtually impossible for the device to malfunction, from a purely physical perspective, I mean. There is always human error. Hey, laughed Pike. Spock gave him an inquisitive look. Forgive me. Of course I should have said operator error. The species of the operator is immaterial to the point. It was thoughtless of me. No offense taken, Pike said. At that moment, the intercom came to life, Enterprise, the Marathon delegates are ready to come aboard. 24 to beam up. We will take them in groups of six, Pike responded. First group, stand by. He adjusted the controls. Energizing. Spock watched as bands of marathons came twinkling into existence on the transporter pad. Cha was in the third group, and he made his way over as soon as he stepped off the pad. Hello, Spock. His voice was low, guarded. Hello, Cha. Well, Cha said with a nervous smile, at least you'll get to see my home. I look forward to that. Crew members had come to show the marathons to their quarters. They were a silent group, and Spock realized that something was not right. None of them looked around at the starship or its crew. None showed the least interest in their surroundings. And except for Cha, no one spoke. As for Cha, he muttered quick, meaningless observations, very warm air, isn't it? Wonder where that goes. That called for no response. In a low voice, Spock said, forgive me, Cha, but what is wrong? Cha gave him a quick glance, his iridescent hair glittering electric blue, magenta, yellow. Wrong? I don't know what you mean, Spock. You don't seem yourself. Cha. It was the loud voice of Karos Mar Santor, Cha's father. Come. Here are our quarters. Cha hurried away, not even looking back. The door hissed open, the Marathan father and son entered their quarters, and the door closed again. We just have time to escort your father to the captain's conference room, Pike said. Spock followed him, still wondering about the transformation that had come over Cha. It was, disturbing. Pike led Sarek and Spock to the conference room, where the tall, craggy Captain Robert April welcomed them with a smile. He turned to Pike and said, Lieutenant Commander, report to the bridge and take us out of orbit. Set a course for Gandar, standard impulse. Yes, Captain, Pike said. Permission to allow Mr. Spock on the bridge? Captain April raised his eyebrows. Granted. Enjoy yourself, Mr. Spock. Spock did not point out that Vulcans did not enjoy themselves. He was too filled with anticipation, a sensation, he thought fleetingly, that in some ways almost resembled excitement. He followed Pike into the turbo lift, where Pike ordered, bridge. To Spock, Pike added, don't expect anything spectacular. You won't even feel anything when we leave orbit, although you'll get a good view of Merith from where we are. I understand, Spock said. They stepped from the lift onto the bridge. Spock quickly took it all in, a large circular room, the forewall dominated by an enormous viewscreen. At the moment, the green, blue, purple, and white-streaked world of Merith rotated there, huge in the viewscreen, with a clear band of twilight separating the night side from the day side. That, of course, was the effect of the binary sun. Mr. Ban, I'm here to take us out of orbit, said Pike. The helmsman, a completely bald young man, glanced over his shoulder. Aye aye, sir. Pike settled into the captain's seat. We have a visitor on the bridge, he announced. This is Mr. Spock. Spock, the lieutenant in the driver's seat is Ledrick Ban. Our navigator is Selina Niles. At communications is Lieutenant Michael Darren. Our science officer is Lieutenant Richard Cheney. And the grumpy old man at the engineering station, is Chief Engineer Powell. Spock nodded to each, in turn. Lieutenant Cheney, may I join you, 
he asked. Sure, said Cheney, a strongly built young human with a closely cut crop of red hair. Spock went to stand slightly behind him, marveling at the compact science center. If you want to know what anything's for, just ask, Cheney said. It's really pretty quiet now. I'm just monitoring our status, that's all. Thank you. Computer, said Cheney, show us a schematic of the primary stars in this system. Working, the computer said in its mechanical, but strangely feminine, voice. A moment later, one of the display panels lit with a representation of the two suns, the crushed oval of the red giant, the brilliant blue pinhead of the fierce companion. Swirls of gas connected them. Fascinating, Spock said. A binary system that has remained stable for more than three billion years. It's the strange composition of the blue-white companion that does it, Cheney replied. It takes up just enough cast-off matter from the companion giant to compensate for its own rate of reaction. Most binaries in this configuration are doomed to a few million years of existence at best, but the Marathan system's good for another four billion years or so. Four billion, three hundred and seventy-one million, nine thousand six hundred, and three, Spock replied. Chapter 3 Gandar was huge and terrible in the viewscreen, its gaseous surface whipped by hydrogen winds, rushing at hundreds of kilometers per hour. Along the night terminator, branches of lightning forked and sputtered, some so long that on Vulcan, they would have reached from one hemisphere of the planet, halfway around the other. At the poles, coronas of electromagnetic energy pulsed and glowed a hundred colors, all shades of red, blue, violet, green and yellow. Watching the chaotic surface, which moved visibly, the enormous planet spun on its poles every 8.3 hours, giving it days and nights just over four hours long, each. Spock wondered what it would be like, to live on either of the two habitable moons. The moons were both in tidal lock, with one face forever toward the gas giant, the other eternally facing space. Anyone on the inner hemisphere would always see that vast orange sphere hanging overhead, day or night, taking up half the sky, seeming almost close enough to touch. It must be oppressive, Spock thought. It would be like waiting for the sky to fall. The innermost moon, Fleta, whirled around the giant planet in a complete orbit every eight days. Unlike its primary, Fleta had a night four days long, and then another variable one when it plunged into Gandar's deep shadow. Fortunately, the gas giant, too small to be a real star, still had enough reaction heat to warm the little moon. The other inhabited moon, Jarita, was farther out, in a three-week orbit. It was also colder, and the marathons who disembarked there, beamed down wearing enviro suits that provided precious warmth. Jarita's space-facing hemisphere was too cold for habitation, so all the colonists lived on the planet's side. And once they had gone, only the half-dozen representatives of Shakir remained in the Marathan quarters. Spock saw little of them. Cha had retreated from friendship and was distant and cool whenever Spock saw him. The adults, including the aged and grim Hul Minak Lasvor, gave Spock even less notice. Once Spock and Sarek, on their way to an observation deck, met Minak coming the other way. The old Marathan glowered at them, his eyes flashing. Sarek inclined his head politely. Live long and prosper, Ambassador Minak, he murmured. We know what you have done, Minak said, and he swept past them. Spock looked after him. What did he mean, father? Sarek took some moments before replying. The Shakir colonists are the most bitter, he said at last. A religious war forced them off the planet more than 200 years ago. Shakir is a hard environment, bitterly cold except in one narrow habitable band. Hul Minak Lasvor leads a faction that wishes to retake Merith itself, to impose order, and enforce obedience to the Shakirian branch of their faith on the homeworld. Impossible, Spock said at once. Their numbers are far too small. Dreams of glory die hard, my son. And when those dreams turn bitter, they lead to thoughts of tyranny and revenge. They spoke no more of it. 
But a few days later, when the Enterprise went into orbit around the inhospitable planet Shakir, Spock remembered his father's words. Shakir was a gloomy reddish-purple sphere, its rocky surface splotched with frozen hydrocarbons and water ice. Cratered and ancient, even its sunward face looked dark, forbidding. The planet had one redeeming feature, unlike Vulcan or Earth, which inclined on their poles relative to their suns, Shakir's north and south poles were almost exactly vertical, with regard to the binary sun. The planet had no seasons at all. But because the warmth was constant, it did have a narrow green band around its equator only several hundred kilometers broad. Here liquid water existed, barely, night temperatures invariably were below freezing, and tough, hardy plant life grew in abundance. Here too, the Marathan colonists had dug in, fashioning underground homes, complexes of tunnels. And here they led mole-like existences, buried underground, but dreaming of the stars. Farewell, Cha, Spock said as he stood beside Lieutenant Commander Pike. On the transporter pad, Cha glanced at his father and then barely nodded. His face was blank, expressionless. Energize, said Hul Minak Losvor, his voice cold. Energizing, responded Pike. He adjusted the controls, the transporter gave its peculiar musical hum, and the last six marathons beamed off the ship. Well, said Pike. That's done. Are you busy, Spock? No. I have nothing to do at the moment. Then come with me, and we'll drop into the junior officer's wardroom. We senior officers like to eat with them from time to time. A glimpse of our splendor encourages them to do their best and become worthy of promotion. Really? Pike laughed at Spock's quizzical expression. No. A joke. But it is an old service tradition, and the junior officers invited me today. They'll be glad to have you join them as well. A joke, Spock said thoughtfully. I know the concept of humor, but what is its purpose? With a shrug, Pike said, to relieve stress, I suppose. Did beaming the marathons down cause you stress? Pike led the way into the corridor. Beaming them down didn't, but perhaps having them aboard did. We tried to be as hospitable as possible. Hul Minak Losvor even got an in-depth inspection of the computer and engineering sections. But they weren't cheerful guests. No, agreed Spock. The wardroom was a narrow, curving compartment with four tables, each one with four to six young men and women already seated. They welcomed the newcomers, and Pike himself brought Spock's vegetarian lunch to the table. Spock was quiet as he ate, listening to the exchanges between the young Starfleet officers with interest. Much was technical, a discussion of some minor computer problems that had just appeared, from what Spock gathered, and much was humorous. The cadets, ensigns, and lieutenants, all seemed to be enjoying their lives immensely. At the end of the meal, the bald helmsman, Lieutenant Ban, called out to Spock from the next table, stick around. You can see me teach this young upstart from engineering a lesson in three-dimensional chess. Spock turned to Pike. May I? By all means, said Pike, gesturing Spock toward the table. Are you a chess aficionado, Mr. Spock? I am not. I do not know what chess is. But I am interested. Oh, well come on, said Ban, grinning. He and the others had cleared the table and had set up something resembling an abstract sculpture, a kind of branching structure with flat rectangles here and there, the rectangles divided into brown and ivory squares. As he set silver and ebony figures on this device, Ban said, Mr. Spock, I don't think you've met Ensign Thedra Alfort. Thedra, Spock is the son of Sarek, the Vulcan ambassador who arranged the Marathan Treaty. Thedra Alfort was a young human female with short black hair, startling blue eyes, and a quizzical expression. She nodded to Spock. How do you do? Spock knew enough about human speech not to ask, how do I do what? He merely nodded gravely in response. You are an engineer, he asked. One day I may be, Thedra said with a wry grin. Right now I'm desperately trying to learn. 
Ban held out his clenched hands. Choose. Phaedra tapped his right hand, and he opened it to reveal a silver figurine. You go first. He put the silver chessman and an ebony one matching it on the board. To Spock, he said, I'm the chess champion of the Enterprise. Phaedra has rashly decided to challenge me. Ah, said Spock. It is a contest. A contest of wit and intelligence, agreed Ban. As we play, I'll explain how each piece moves. Maybe you'd like to learn the game. Spock watched as Thedra went down to long, hard-fought defeat. For most of an hour she held her own or was down only a pawn or so. But Ban had an uncanny knack of anticipating her moves, blocking her plans, and retaliating in unexpected ways. Finally, her king trapped in one rook just taken by a bishop, Thedra shook her head. No use, she sighed. It would be mate, in four moves. I resign. Mate in three moves, responded Ban with a grin. But hey, who's counting? The young officers had formed a circle around the two, and throughout play they had murmured observations and comments. Now they commiserated with Thedra. Hey, don't take it so hard, one said. He beat me in fifteen minutes flat. Another punched the speaker playfully on the arm. And that was no great feat either. May I play? Spock asked. They all fell silent, giving him surprised glances. Ban looked up, his bald head glistening. Are you serious? Spock raised an eyebrow. Yes. With a shark-like grin, Ban began to set up the board. This I have to see, he announced. Have a seat, my Vulcan friend. Half Vulcan, Spock responded, sitting across the board from Ban. Ban paused in setting up the pawns. Really? My mother is human, explained Spock. Ban's grin, became more friendly. My father is too, he said. My mother's Deltan, though. Well, as one half human to another, good luck. Chance does not appear to play a great role in this contest, Spock observed. With a laugh, Ban said, you take the silver pieces as a courtesy to a new player. Let the slaughter begin. The officers crowded around as Spock made his first move. Lieutenant Ban nodded. A standard gambit, he said, which I counter like this. He moved a pawn. With Spock's next move, a murmur began. Then when he moved again, it became a buzz. Ban frowned at the board, reached to move a knight, thought better of it, and instead castled his king. Spock responded by taking a bishop. I didn't see that coming, someone said. Quiet, hissed Ban, scowling in concentration. Three more exchanges of moves, and then Spock sent his rook down to his opponent's level. I will capture your king with the next move, he said. Ban exhaled. You say, checkmate, now. Why do I say that? Because you beat me, that's why. Oh. Checkmate. Eleven minutes and nineteen seconds, someone said, awe in her voice. I never thought it was possible. You've played before, Ban said to Spock. No, I haven't. Come on. How could you beat me if you've never played the game? Spock looked up. He was the center of attention. It is a very logical process, he said simply. They all laughed as if he had made a joke. Even Ban, grinned. Spock, I met you two years too late. If I'd only known you during my senior year at Starfleet Academy, you could have tutored me in logic. Then maybe I could have done better in Federling's class, and graduated first, instead of ninth. Federling's a terror, Thedra all four agreed. Wouldn't it be great to see him arguing with someone as logical as Spock? A muscular lieutenant in a red security tunic chuckled. I'd give up two years seniority to see that, he said. Hey, someone else said, Federling's class was no joke, but what about the simulator trials? Can't you just see Spock at the control when old Jeffries causes three simultaneous systems failures? Zip, 
Zap, Zowie. The repairs were all very logical, Mr. Jeffries. Spock said mildly, I do not understand what. A rasping klaxon horn cut him off. The young officers leaped toward the door, and Spock found himself trotting along the corridor beside Mr. Ban. What is happening? he asked. Without looking around, the young lieutenant snapped, We must be under attack, it's a red alert. End of chapter. This book is part of our exclusive series available to Patreon supporters. If you would like to listen to this entire book, please visit patreon.com slash yjk audiobooks. The link is also available in the video description below. Thank you for listening, and may you live long and prosper.